Good morning, everyone. You're in for a time-saving and mind-blowing treat today because I'm here with Dennis Mortensen, the founder of X.AI. Thanks so much for joining me, Dennis. Thanks, much. Wonderful to be here. I want to start out just introducing everyone to Amy. So Amy is your new personal assistant. She'll schedule your meetings all for free, and she's synced up with your calendar. All you have to do is just copy her on your email chain. Dennis, before we dive into all of this, I'd love for you to explain your work because I have a feeling that no one's going to believe that what I said is true. I think that at least the one word that we came up with of invisible software is the best way to describe her. So we don't want to create yet another app or yet another plugin or yet another extension or web service or something that looks like that. What I want is something which smells like a real human assistant, something for where there is no syntax. There's really just a job to be done here. And I don't really care whether Dennis hired 500 people in the Philippines, whether he created an AI and it's all just running off a set of servers in the cloud or how the hell I do it. What I want, though, is if I CC an Amy and ask her to kindly set up a meeting with John, my friend, come in the next week, but no later than eight, she just, just that. No syntax, no requirements, no nothing, just something for where, you know what, I'm actually a little bit unsure about whether she does sit here in the front office or she will come pick me up at the lobby. I actually just want something where I don't have to think about it. And without kind of patting myself you know, too much <laughs> on the back here, I actually think it's not just us. I think there will be a wave of software in the not too distant future that will take that form. It's just that we decided to kind of tackle the kind of quite well-defined pain of setting up a meeting. I think everybody understands exactly what we do. And when they ask me, I just tell them, so what do you do, Dennis? I schedule meetings. No more, no less. We're just trying not to hire a thousand people. We're trying to kind of create this AI that can have this human, human-like dialogue. So when I've seized it in Amy, her first task is to remove me from the conversation because I asked her to do a job. Don't ask me to participate. That's the whole reason I hired you, Amy. You do your job, I'll do mine. And she'll then have as you and I did for this exact meeting, a dialogue with mm -hmm. the guests trying to figure out that today, this morning, you and I are supposed to meet up. This is my Skype ID. This is yours. We connected. So at least in this one instance, she was successful. And that's what I want. And that's what we're trying to create here. I have to say, Dennis, the Skype ID is what got me, that she put the Skype ID in before I asked. That was really impressive. See, that's where I think and this might be really unfair to humans, and you, are, you and I are certainly humans <laughs> here, but she'll remember, as in really remember. So I'll remember your name. I'll remember it tomorrow, in a year from now, in 10 years from now, perhaps not. Or I can certainly memorize your Skype ID because we had a call this morning. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, perhaps still, in a week, I've forgotten your Skype ID. I can look it up, though. However, Amy... Because I told her once, this is my Skype ID. If we have any Skype calls, you can use that freely. She'll remember forever and not ever forget it. That, I think, is just the fantastic thing about having a machine do certain jobs for you. Here's my number. Here's my Skype ID. Here's my address. I might even, in that initial kind of handover of my address, be really kind of kind. It's 48 Wall Street, it's the fifth floor, but you need to do this at the lobby. I don't want to say it every time. I just want her to really you know, learn from what I tell her. And that's kind of, as you say, wonderful. Because I told her once and then, heck, even before you asked, it was already there in the invite. You guys are currently running a closed beta program that is literally bursting with requests. Because you're yeah. working in such uncharted territory, how important has it been to have such hands-on relationships with your early adopters? So we are, and again, I'm saying this uh, without patting myself uh, on the back, certainly taking on a challenge <laughs> that is huge. And hell, for all I know, we might just die trying. But 
doing it alone in the dark for two years straight and come out one morning in late 2015 with a ta-da, we've solved this, just seemed unrealistic. So really what we need here is enough edge cases for us to really understand what is a meeting. So if you spend two minutes thinking about it, you'll end up with, oh, a meeting is really a coming together of one or more people on a date, at a time, at a specific location. Then if you spend 10 minutes thinking about it, oh, but location can be either virtual or in-person. Ah, if in-person, who decides where it is? Whoever decides where it is, what if he doesn't tell me? Do I then cancel the meeting? Then if you spend an hour thinking about it, it becomes even more complex. If you then spend a day thinking about it, you kind of get to the point for where, dang it, I'm not sure we can solve this mm -hmm. because it's kind of very simple initially, but just extremely hard once you kind of start to drill into it. But it's, it's a problem uh, worth tackling. I know that it's a problem we're tackling, and certainly people agree with you because you guys just brought your funding in to just about over $11 million, which is huge with your Series A. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. And next, I want to know, Dennis, I know you've done this before because you've started and sold three successful companies. How did you go into these meetings and convince people to put their money behind this idea? Because it's a bit crazy, like we've said. So I'm certainly no expert. I have opinion. So you can take my opinion, mm -hmm. but don't take it as being conclusive or the current state of affairs for how you go raise uh, $10. We did, certainly in our past ventures who were enterprise ventures for where the outcome is a little bit more predictable. You go get one customer, he'll pay you $100,000. I'll use that to hire another engineer. With that engineer, I'll sell another customer. I'll get another $100,000 and there we go. And that turns into a business over time. This, though, as you suggest, is a little bit more of a gamble. <laughs> and just a little. Just a little, yes. And I thought any sane person would think that that would be a harder set of conversations. I think perhaps this was not easier because nothing is never easy. But certainly not 10x harder just because the challenge is 10x harder. I think it's about the same. If anything, a little bit easier, because I think we can all agree that if we pull it off, if we solve it, the market is huge. As in, you and I can debate about whether it's a billion dollars or $10 billion market, but it's a huge market. So it really came down to whether, is this the right time? And if it is the right time, is this the right team? And if it's the right team, why aren't we all in? Because we know the market is huge. So certainly I think there was a, an easier path to kind of defend the fact that we can discuss whether it's today or next year. But I don't think we can even discuss whether it's happening or not. If not me, sure. There'll be another eight guys right behind me from Cambridge who'll solve it. Mm -hmm. If not them, there'll be another 10 guys from Palo Alto who'll solve it. But at some point, some guy will be crazy enough to come along and say, today's the day, and I'm going to get 25 guys around the table, and we're going to hash this out. I think, though, the, where some of the bravery arrives is uh, not so much on me, but certainly on, on the team, which is, this is not a weekend hackathon. <laughs> this is not a three months Y Combinator thing. This is a year-long endeavor for where... I think you do need to have a certain level of patience and just accept the fact that we're not going to solve this tomorrow, but we need to create a path towards having this solved, not in 10 years, but in the foreseeable future. We're in good shape, and uh, even what you've seen of Amy so far, she's not crazy, right? You know, she's not Jessie, crazy. She's not crazy. She does work. That doesn't mean that I've seen all the edge cases, but she's working. She's in good shape. She's a teenager. I need to, you know, see her kind of grow up. But this might be the right time. This seems like a good team. The current progress is astonishing. So 
we understand it's a bet, but that's the business that they're in. They just need to pick good bets. And we <laughs> think this is a good bet, but I'm biased. Well, you've mentioned a lot, Dennis, about your team and how much you needed that to execute a mission like this. So it leads me right into one of the questions we have from our audience today. Adam is curious, as you bring on more team members in the coming months, I know that's one of your goals after the Series A, what are the top three qualities that you're looking for in new hires? So this is a data science play. This is not an outsourcing play or an oper operational play. This is just really a matter of us being able to solve what we believe is the hard science behind bringing Amy to life. So we're looking for really smart data scientists. We're looking for people who dare work in the dark. There is no solution. There is no paper for where this is described, but we need to just go implement it. There is no solution. So people brave enough to kind of walk up to a blank whiteboard and say, okay, here we go. Today it is. That takes, I think, a specific set of people. And those are the ones that we're looking for. With that comes you know, the real work of good, solid back-end engineers that needs to go implement and maintain some of the models that we put in place. But we have a solid team. We're 25 today. We're adding another 15 uh, this year. That will be just enough for us to really make good progress. Because remember, we just schedule meetings. So you're <laughs> going to have 40 smart guys in a room just trying Scheduling to do that. Scheduling my meeting. Yep. This is it. One of the things that I got really excited about was Josh Gutman, who's one of the partners at SoftBank, said that Amy creates a kind of magic that really gets an investor's wheels turning. Because this can, like Tesla opened up the model for electric cars, you're opening up a completely new industry. How are you going to maintain that excitement along the way? Because there's a lot of roadblocks that you can hit. I mean, certainly one of them is the wait list. Yeah. It's a good question. I think, which doesn't mean that I know, <laughs> but I think that this is just the very beginning of intelligent agents. So some people from afar might think that I compete with Apple Siri, Microsoft Cortana, Google Now, IBM Watson, and similar. I don't think that's the case. If you think about it in this way, which is, what is it, a little bit more than half a decade ago that they put out the iPhone. Their first iteration had this kind of mental concept for where they would make all the software on the That's phone. So you bought the phone and there was 40 some odd apps included. And they, I think, quickly figured out that they're never going to get to the end of that. So at some point they opened up and we now have a million apps. That means that your iPhone is different to mine. Mm -hmm. If you look at Siri, why is that not the same? Isn't it just a little bit naive to believe that you can create a personal assistant that can do all the jobs in the world? So perhaps Siri is not really a personal assistant. Perhaps he's just an enabler. Perhaps the way I would use her is, hey, Siri, can you get Amy to set up a meeting with Tommy next week? Mm -hmm. I'm just one of those intelligent agents. Then there'll be another agent that can help do some other odd thing that you want to do, and that's okay. That won't be me. So I think we're at the very beginning of these intelligent agents. I also believe that if that is to be true, and I do solve this you know, one vertical of setting up meetings, and I gain your trust, I don't think it would take too long for you and I to kind of see that there might be other things that I can expand on within that, if I have your trust to go schedule your meetings. I'm trying not to think about it today, though. I'm trying to think of it just as getting meeting scheduling right. And I think that's, everyone certainly respects that, but I read a lot of articles where people are saying, hey, what if, like you said, can Amy do my travel? Can Amy send up Tinder dates? So the future for you guys is really limitless. Yep. Yep. I agree. So with that, though, Dennis, with so many verticals available for you, 
to expand and essentially become the apple of AI. How are you just focusing on one? I think my mom told me at some point that there was not much value in being okay at five different jobs. You needed to really be world class at one thing. And if you're world class at one thing, there's really a ton of value in that. So I don't want to do a half assed job on booking tables, booking hotel rooms, setting up travels, and perhaps getting your meeting right. I just want to go so deep that it becomes obvious that we're the best at it. Yes, some people might arrive and say, we're going to try to tackle this meeting scheduling thing that Dennis and the guys are working on. No, I want them to just surrender, even just by looking at it. Hey, 40 propeller heads in a room who worked on it for two years. Whatever idea I have, it really needs to be good if you want to kind of outdo that. So I don't want to be half-assed. This is it. I want to solve it so that you won't ever be in doubt. We fixed it. As in, we'll have a laugh in two years' time or three years' time for when we actually did the email ping-pong back and forth. There'll be a whole ha-ha moment. But now that's solved. But we spent two decades, right? I've done the same email ping-pong for 25 years straight since I got my first email in 91, 92. I want to remove that. Once I've removed that and we all agree that I won, sure, we can talk about, you know, what else to do. But win first. Don't, win you know, first and then talk about next the season. trophy before that. Very yeah. true. Exactly. So then right on that note, Dennis, I was wondering, is the day that you know Amy has become entirely successful, the day that my Amy and your Amy coordinate our meeting and we don't have a part in it? So that's where the magic happens. So today, just some rough uh, statistics. It'll take about two and a half days for a human to set up another mm -hmm. meeting with a friend or colleague. Not because they're lazy, just because two humans got other stuff to do. I send you an email, there's a delay in your inbox, you reply back tonight or tomorrow, there's a delay in my inbox, and it'll take about two and a half days. Remember, we know this, we have that data. What we've seen is that we've been able to cut that down to a day and a half when you're in the man-machine world, for where one party is a machine, for where Amy doesn't sleep. So she'll reply <laughs> back at 3 a.m. So that cuts it down to a day and a half. Not because she's lazy, just because we still work with people. They're still busy. They're going to be able to get back to you right now. But as you suggest, there might be a moment for where I suggest that you and I set up a meeting next week and I've seen in Amy and I'll ask her to kind of help me out. But your response might just be one of, oh, wonderful. I've seen it in Andrew on my mm -hmm. side. He can help hash this out with Amy. But what if Andrew is really Amy? Who is she talking to? And she's talking to herself and the whole thing becomes instant. So we go from two and a half days on a human-human basis to a day and a half on a machine-human basis to near instant. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes magical, right? That means the day before, if I own the network, and this is my own kind of personal entrepreneurial fantasy, so don't you know, think I'm delusional just yet, but you know, <laughs> as a fantasy, it's funny to kind of just play out. If I own that network, then the day before I go to San Francisco, an hour before I go to San Francisco, I can have all my meetings set up because there is no ping pong. It's just done. It's done. Other kind of interesting concepts that will kind of change the paradigm for how we think of meetings without getting too kind of uh, you know, out there. But today when we set up a meeting, there's some stigma in having it rescheduled. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. You said you rescheduled over 600 when you were thinking about this. That's what led you to the idea of Amy. Yeah, I counted my meetings in 2012. That's horrible. That's just, no one deserves that. 672 reschedules. But we could imagine that if there's no cost in setting up a meeting and there's no cost in having it rescheduled, then perhaps there is no stigma in seeing it rescheduled. So perhaps all I want is to talk to you. We could reschedule this 17 times. I might not even know. That so say that exactly. I have... 
I might have a meeting in Midtown, but Amy know that I'm not too fond of heading up to Midtown. So she's kind of moving it back and forth to kind of really kind of sneak it in with another meeting in Midtown that might arrive a little bit later so that I get not I mean, the meeting might be full and not kind of fixed to my calendar. It's just getting more and more fixed as we move closer towards this. So perhaps we could change the whole paradigm. That's not today. That's, you know, for another day. But that's my own kind of personal fantasy for where how we think of meetings isn't in this kind of very fixed, stiff way for where a ton of stigma applied to kind of having it both set up and rescheduled and all of that. That might just disappear. So we don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. So but Dennis, that's not tomorrow. <laughs> that's okay. We're, we're okay waiting. Yeah. I want to close with a question I'm going to ask in every 33 Founders interview this season. You've been very open about the unknown unknowns that are going to come up with Amy. And you've even been open that when you get there, you're probably not going to know how to fix it. You're going to have to figure it out. How are you navigating this immense uncertainty, both as a CEO of the company and then just as Dennis when you go home at night? So, on the Dennis front, all I really want come the end, then you, you and I can talk about what the end mm -hmm. means, but at some point in life where I'll sit down with the mojito and say, <laughs> I played this out five times over and that was enough. Let me just sit here, read my book, have my mojito and be happy. All I want is a good set of stories. I want to be able to say that, you know what? We had fun. That was, that was really fun. We won some, we lost some, but it was fun. So with that uncertainty, if anything, just adds to the story. I'm actually okay in losing. Some of the best stories are the ones where you fought the good fight, but you lost. That's okay. So that, you know, I sleep like a baby. Absolutely okay with it. So you were just saying that you think uncertainty actually adds to the story at the end. And as much as I would love to say, oh my God, I totally agree. I'm 21 and I'm not sure I would be okay saying I tried and it didn't really work out. So what advice do you have to entrepreneurs who are not in your same shoes of being very successful to say, hey, the uncertainty is actually a good thing? I like to think of it as having been given an opportunity. So if you and I, for some reason, for instance, to play tennis, mm -hmm. we got exactly five sets to make a go for it. That would be a great story. We're not supposed to be there, but it'll be a great story. And we're probably going to lose. <laughs> While we do that, that's probably going to be the only thing we do. You're not going to pause in the middle of the mass and say, hey, let me uh, go uh, do this. Let me uh, call my friend. Let me do this. So I like the idea of at least knowing that you've been given the opportunity then just play it out with all you have. So there's a ton of things which I don't do so that I can tell people that I played the game to the best of my ability and I loved it. So I don't sit on boards, I don't advise, I don't angel invest, I don't do anything but extra day I. And I like to just play it out. That is that one match, I'll do the best I have, perhaps I shouldn't even have been here, I'm going to play it out. So that at least provides me some comfort in, I did the best I could. And perhaps it wasn't the right time, perhaps I wasn't smart enough, perhaps a number of other things, but I played it. What I don't like is when I see other people who's been given that opportunity that don't play it out. I say, mm. oh yeah, I'm kind of working on two projects. Anybody who tells me that story, I lost all interest in both projects immediately. Never oh, heard of it yeah. that way. I run a company and then I do a little bit of investing on the side. Then I lost interest both in your company and your investments. Or I advise multiple companies. How about you advise yourself? at least. That should be your primary concern. So I'm just personally not too fond of that. You don't hear a great footballer 
come in and say, you know what, I played for Barcelona, but then you know, over the weekend, I play for Bayern Munich as well. No, you don't. You play for Barcelona, and this is where you turn up Monday morning, and you're going to do your best at that. So that's, you know, that's what I like. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of honor in just telling people that's what I do. You can never kind of second-guess you know, my loyalty to this one game. I, I might surrender or die trying. That's cool, but I'm here while we play. I think that's the perfect way to end it. So we'll leave it as play it with everything you've got. I like to do that. So thank you so much, Dennis, for being with us today and sharing Amy. I want everyone to know that they can stay up with Dennis by following him on Twitter at Dennis Mortensen. And you can follow x.i at x-d-o-t-a-i. So everyone, please stay up to date with them. Let us know what you think in the comments. And if you didn't get your question answered today, submit it at 33 Voices and we'll be make, sh make sure to get it out in the next one. Thank you guys. Thank you very much for having me.